Um, thank you so much for making time to be here tonight. For those of you who I have not met, my name is Danielle Fkira. I'm the Director of Alumni and Parent Engagement here at Landmark. This is my fourth school year. Um, and tonight we are presenting um, one of the, this is the second, second event um, and first topic on Landmark Learns, which is a new initiative to bring topical content and resources to parents and guardians. So thank you for being here with us. Um, we're so proud to still be in school and still have your students um, learning in person and whether they're accessing the program in different ways. We're so happy to continue to be together. And I think a silver lining of this whole situation is being online and doing more resource driven content like this. So and being able to access our parents and video this and share it afterwards. So just a friendly reminder that tonight is being recorded. Um, we will share this after the fact. So if you have to hop off for any reason, feel free. Um, we're very flexible tonight. Um, I see everyone is introducing themselves in the chat. Thank you. Please continue to do that. I think it's a great resource and way for ways for people to connect. Um, we love that everyone has that opportunity. So tonight, my colleague Katie and Mich colleagues Katie and Michelle will help us um, by managing the tech in your questions. So as Meg presents, you can put any questions you have right into the chat. And what they will do is pull those questions out and then um, present them to Meg at the end. So she'll go through about a 35 minute presentation. And at the very end, we'll answer as many questions as we can. We should end at about eight o'clock. We might go a little bit past. Again, if you have to hop off, we totally understand. Um, and we will do our best to um, be timely and get to everyone's questions. So I want to thank Meg Arneo for putting together this amazing presentation and working with us um, to make this possible and deliver really content focused information that is specific to your students age and grade. So I am going to mute myself at this point. Um, and Meg, please take it away. All right. Thanks, Danielle. Um, welcome, everyone, to our uh, Landmark Learns event. I'm so happy to be here um, and able to speak with you all. Um, I not only am an elementary teacher at the EMS, I also taught in middle school for a few years when I first started. Um, I've been at the school now for about 16 years, and I just really love it so much um, getting to meet new kids every year. And chances are, if you had a student that started in elementary, I have had them before because they start, you know, right from the bottom there. Um, another role that I have at the school is as the director of the Landmark um, Summer Institute for Outreach, which reaches teachers. So I'm really excited to do this event, which is reaching parents. Um, we have a lot of people sign up because they want to know more about their students' learning profiles and all of that. So I'm happy to be able to get to do this for just a group of parents and get really focused questions um, based on what you're seeing at home with your students. And hopefully we can answer a lot of those tonight. Um, let's see, there we go. All right. So. True Landmark style, I'm gonna start with an agenda. Um, we have the introduction, which I just kind of finished up there introducing myself. I'm gonna go over a couple of definitions for executive function. Um, after that, I will introduce you to Landmark's six teaching principles. Um, following that, we'll go over some organizational strategies that are specific to Landmark. Um, they kind of cross through elementary and middle school in varying degrees. Then I'm gonna kind of bring it back to um, one of the quotes, one of the definitions for executive function is by a man named Thomas Brown. Um, and he has identified these six clusters of executive function that tie in really well with our six teaching principles. Um, and then at the end, if there are any questions, um, I'm happy to answer anything that you've got. I may not know the answers, but I'll do the best that I can. Um, all right, why don't we go ahead and start off. So our first, Thing that I'm going to talk about is just the definition of executive function. Um, this is a quote from Patricia Newhall, who at one point was very heavily involved in the Landmark Outreach Program as well. And in her book, um, Executive Function and Foundations for Learning and Teaching, she states, executive function is the brain's ability to coordinate the cognitive and psychological processes needed to initiate, sustain, monitor, and adapt to the behaviors and attitudes which required to achieve a goal. 
Now right there, it's pretty meaty. It's giving all of these different um, abilities that you have to have to be able to have these great executive function skills. You need to initiate, sustain, monitor, adapt, and think about these attitudes that come in at the same time. So think about your students, think about your kids. And are these things that are strengths for them? Chances are probably not. Maybe they have a strength in one or two of the areas. Um, but the reason why they're at Landmark is because these are a weakness for them. And um, our goal is to help those become more of a strength or to help them find ways to navigate through having weaknesses in those areas. All right. Second quote, it's a bit long, but I really, um, I really love a lot the, um, the middle sentence on this one. So this is from Thomas Brown, who is um, a clinical psychologist out of California. And what he states for executive function is observing the problems that result when attention fails has allowed me to notice the effects of attentional processes on multiple aspects of daily life, documenting the interconnected improvements that occur when attentional impairments are effectively treated has shown me the subtle but powerful linkages between attention and multiple aspects of the brain's management system. All of these observations have led me to conclude that attention is essentially a name for the integrated operation of the executive functions of the brain. So attention plays a big piece um, in the ability to have these executive function skills um, and have them to kind of work out in the way that you would hope for them to work out as you're, as you're learning. All right, now Landmark Six teaching principles have been around for you know, decades. Um, it's kind of the basis of the school and it's what we really try to base everything that we're doing in the classroom on. We're trying to hit each of these principles in each of our classes every day. Um, and you'll see how these uh, teaching principles really link up with um, Thomas Brown's six clusters that once we get to those a little bit later on. So our first teaching principle is to provide opportunities for our students to experience success. Um, chances are if kids are coming to Landmark at some point in their life, they've experienced not having success with their work. So everything that we're doing is trying to increase their um, ability to see that they're able to achieve goals. Um, we're really micro-uniting things, really breaking things down so that they can feel good about what they're doing. We're never gonna wanna give them something that's gonna make them feel inadequate. We will push every once in a while to kind of see where um, they're struggling and see what we can help them get better at. But everything that we're doing is trying to provide opportunities for success. Um, our second principle is using multi-sensory approaches to teaching. And that can go across the board. If you've seen any of our math um, curriculum from Chris Wooden, that is all about multi-sensory. We're getting our kids up and jumping around. We're moving. We're using PVC pipes to build graphs. Um, it's really an amazing program, that math program. But we're also using it in our other classes as well. We're incorporating hand movements and um, just body movements into what we're learning to try to uh, give different ways for the students to really ingrain um, what they're learning. Now, our third principle is using micro units and structured tasks for every student. So this really ties in if we are giving something that has multiple steps, we're never going to give the full list of steps all at the beginning um, and then expect them to be able to carry through, you know, five different steps on a worksheet or five different steps on a project everything will be micro united and kind of given to them piecemeal as is appropriate. Um, and that can be adjusted whether you're a second grader or an eighth grader. Um, the classes that I teach now are typically second and third graders. Um, it is a kind of a mixed class because we, we kind of want to um, get them at their skill level. So they're paired with a group of kids that are at the same skill level, but we're still working on a lot of the same tasks as you might see moving up through the different grades, just kind of pared down and made appropriate for, for the levels that they're at. Our fourth teaching principle is to ensure automatization through practice and review. Um, we're constantly spiraling back, constantly going back and uh, re re revisiting skills that we have learned before. We're never going to teach a skill and then completely move on from that and not revisit it because 
uh, chances are it's going to kind of leave their memory and it will be a skill that they that they kind of lose. So we want to make sure that practice and review is kind of keeping that in their working memory and keeping that as something that they are able to able to recall when we're working on new skills. All right, principle number five, to provide models for our students to use as a guide. And that comes across in, in a few different ways. It can be models on their homework. It could be models on their classwork. It be, could be models even for, um, in our oral expression class, we're giving models about how to present, um, you know, present a story or how to give an object description or to even like have a conversation in our, um, so, uh, we have a, um, just lost my brain here. <laughs> um, we have a social thinking curriculum in the elementary where we're kind of teaching kids how to have a con conversation with other kids, how to get through difficulties, how to make friends and that sort of thing. So we're always trying to provide models um, in a lot of different ways, sometimes visual, sometimes oral. All right, teaching principle number six is to include students in the learning process. Um, I've had a lot of kids where once I kind of realize that they're not buying into what we're doing and don't really trust us yet, sometimes it's because they're not quite sure why we're doing what we're doing. So really having the kids understand why we're doing a certain thing, um, they may know the information already, but it's really we're using information to learn a new process or learn how to do use a new template or something like that. All right. So next, I'm going to talk a little bit about some organizational strategies. Um, it's never too early to start learning how to organize your space, your time, or your materials. So we do a lot of that in the beginning of the year. It's definitely time consuming, um, but it's worth it when you get to the end of the year. It's, it's funny, every year I start with a fresh batch of students, and I typically have students that have never been to Landmark before, aren't repeat students. So I forget the beginning of every year, like how many things they're not able to do. Just basic, you know, organizational strategies, putting a paper into a folder, having the same folder when they come to class the next day, keeping track of their pencil from one minute to two minutes later. Um, so, uh, and at the end of every year, things just feel so natural, so smooth, that when I start that next year, I'm like, wait, what? Like, why are they not able to do any of these things? And I have to like remind myself, oh, that's right. <laughs> It's like, it's a, it's a whole new skill that they're not comfortable with that they've never probably had to do before. All right, so why are organizational skills important? Um, when we're at school and we're in class, it can lead to increased time on task. Um, if we have our papers organized, have our folders, have our pencils, we can get started with class um, a lot more quickly and get to more classwork and more instructional time. Uh, it's a more efficient use of time. So if we come knowing where we're going to have things filed in our binders or in our folders already, we're not flipping through and looking for things in a kind of a lost place. It can increase the quality of our work um, because if the students are able to find all the templates or all of the different um, school supplies that they need as we're working, um, then they're not having that thought in their brain of like, you know, worrying about where something is. They're able to just kind of get right to, right to the task. Uh, having organizational skills reduces the number of questions. And while questions are great, um, if we can kind of reduce a lot of that by giving them the tools to know where they should be able to find all of their items, then that's making them a little bit more independent, which is that next idea there. So seeing the way that the kids really take hold of the organizational skills that we practice in school um, is really nice to see towards the end of the year where they just kind of know what to do and they're really just able to do a lot on their own and not need as much guidance. Um, and it also leads to additional self-confidence because they're not having to ask. You'll have you know, some kids who are a little bit shy to ask for help or um, just don't want the other kids to see that they have to ask for help. So if we give them these tools to kind of have themselves organized and be in charge of their own supplies and their own items, then um, they can really feel, feel good about being able to get everything done on their own. Um, this is a, something I'm gonna put on here. We're gonna see at the beginning, we're also gonna see it at the end, but, and it's super hard, but one thing that um, Rob Kahn often says a lot, who was the former um, director of the school is don't do anything for your child that they can do for themselves. 
Now that's really hard a lot of the time because a lot of the time you're trying to get out the door or just get ready to move on to the next task. So it's so much quicker and easier to do that, but really taking the time when you're starting to learn a new skill um, to, to be able to do it on your own is super, super important. All right, so these are the three organizational strategies that we focus a lot on at Landmark. And you'll see um, a lot of the pictures and visuals that I'm gonna show you here in all of the classes um, from second grade up through the middle school. So we're gonna talk a little bit about materials organization, space or location organization and organization of time. All right. So one of the things that you might see in a landmark classroom um, is the ready for class checklist. Now this takes away that time when a student might have to ask for help or ask for what they need, gives a really clear visual of the items that they're expected to have and what they're expected to be able to get ready. Um, uh, most classes, you know, we're taking out a binder, making sure we have a pencil, getting our name, date and day on every sheet um, a lot of kids, when they're getting their homework ready it's, or done at, at home, they're not checking all the way through. So some teachers give that time to check your name, date, and day, or just even to look over your paper to see that everything is done when you first get to your classroom to make sure before you hand it in. Um, another thing that we consistently use is an assignment notebook. Um, and for each class, even if we are not giving homework, and even this year, you know, um, switching to this new type of learning situation that we're doing right now. We, we don't currently have homework as something that the students are getting, but I'm still trying to get them to learn the format for this and get comfortable with using it as it kind of, as we kind of track through our day. So each class would have its own, um, I think for this, for this planner, the days go vertically and then the classes go horizontally. So even if we're just gonna work on like writing in cursive in LA, I'll have the kids write, write, in, write the word cursive in their assignment notebook. Or if we're working on map skills in social studies, we'll write map skills so that we can kind of keep track of some of the different things that we've been working on. And eventually if we get to that homework point this year, um, we could have them plug that in there and have a good spot for them to refer back to if they need help. All right. Um, one thing that I am really passionate about is getting their binders really organized. Um, we try to have them have as little in their binders as possible. And I know it's really fun to go out and get the really beautiful binder and it comes with a pencil bag and tons of lined paper and you know cute folders and everything. And I'm a really big proponent for just no nonsense binders. Um, this is a typical setup for one of the students in my class. And I sometimes, um, when they get to school and we realize that there are some troubles with you know, papers in and out of folders, um, these plastic sleeves, I think I got these from like the dollar section at Target, but they also sell them at, um, at Staples. But these are really great for just being able to really easily access your folders and really easily access your items that are inside of those. And then we've just got a different, um, section for not done and done, really clear cut, just as little wording as possible, just showing that these are the things that you have to do when you get home. These are the things that are totally finished. Um, our classroom folders. So this year we've got our classroom folders and then they also have those take home folders in their binders. And for in-class folders, it's the same sort of setup. It's just the same language. It's really consistent um, with our not done and our done side. And for the folders that kids have taken home, we've got that same setup as, as well for several of them, just a not done in the done side. And I am a little bit of a um, like organizational color freak. So I really like to match up my colors for everything because it just kind of layers on that, um, just another way to really keep track of things and keep things visual, especially for non-readers who are having trouble kind of flipping through and finding the right folder if it's got the name of the class on it. So you'll notice this is my uh, daily agenda for my class. Um, given that I'm in an el the elementary program, all of the students have that same schedule from language arts on. A little bit different in the middle school, but um, for my class, what I like to do is we've got the part of the day that we're on, 
our arrow moves down with a little Velcro piece to show where we're at. So we're showing kind of the passage of time throughout our day. And then I also have a little sticker on the class label that matches up with the color of our folder. So if we are moving our, our uh, arrow down throughout the day, we can see that we're on math. We know we're gonna get that red folder out. If we're moving down to LA, we know we're on the orange sticker. We know we're gonna use that orange folder. Um, so it just kind of takes away some of the things that I have to say out loud to them. And they can kind of look up and they'll say, what folder do I need? And I'll just say, we'll look at the board. And they figure that out. And after the first few times, it becomes more natural for them to just kind of like look up there, figure out what they need and not need to ask me for help figuring out. All right, our second organizational um, strategy is to think about organization of space or location. So their personal space at school, their desk, um, again, it's as bare bones as possible, as little in there as possible. Now, this is a desk that probably just got cleaned out. They're not always gonna look like that. There's definitely kids that have like seven or eight or 25 papers just kind of shoved to the back of their desk. Um, so we typically will do a desk clean out if we can, if those random you know, drawing papers have reached to the back of their desk. Um, so we're really just trying to pare it down and have just what they need, two pencils sharpened, their binder ready to take out so that they can write in their assignment notebook and a pencil box that has all the supplies that they need. All right, we've also got our items around the classroom. Um, this year, given the, um, given the effects of COVID and everything, we have each student has an individual pencil box that has everything that they need. So we're not, we're not sharing items like you see here in a typical school year. Um, everything, their folders are passed out to them by me. They have their own personal pencil box. So there's less of a classroom space organization thing happening right now, but that could be something that you're taking a look at at home. Maybe the space that they're working in has too many supplies or maybe there's too many distractions around. So you could think about just kind of taking a look at where they're learning and what could be kind of getting in the way, what could be taken out of that space. All right. Um, Sarah Ward is a really brilliant speech and language pathologist who has developed some really good models, some visual schemas that are really effective with students. So having a picture of what you want their area to look like right next to the area can help kids do that organization on their own. So um, it could be either just having a picture just like the cubbies here, you know, binders at the bottom, book bag in the middle, extra items up at the top, or it could be a picture view here that shows like, do you have all of these items? Are you ready? All right, just a couple worksheet examples of how to think about personal space, like organizing your backpack. Um, Understood.org has a lot of really great printables for parents and for teachers that just help to highlight different organizational strategies, um, back to school ideas. Um, they're a really, really awesome resource that I pull things from all of the time. All right. Now we've already seen this picture here, but this is a slide just to remind us that um, organization of time is a big deal. Um, we have a posted agenda for each day, which is here, and then for each class, which is here. Having that posted agenda um, can really take away some of the anxiety for some of the kids about like, how many items do we need to do? Like, what do we need to get through? How close are we to being finished with class? Which is a question that comes up a lot. Like how much, how many more minutes till the end of class? And I can just refer back and say like, well, let's, let's look and see how many items we have left on our agenda. So it helps them to kind of see that it's not always necessarily tied to time, but it's tied to, can we get through what we've got on our agenda? And can we finish the tasks that we have set before us? Um, so my agenda here, when I organize my agenda on the board, I'm also matching up my colors of my marker with the class that we're in. So this is in green, this is our science class. It's just another visual reference point for them to look up at. Um, Homework, I would usually write down at the bottom in a totally different color so they know, they know that's a different item for them to write into their assignment notebook. All right, um, when we're doing an, an activity in class, if we're doing activities kind of shorter duration, um, I, like, I really love to use either an analog clock as a timer or a digital timer. Um, I'm a big 
big believer in using the analog clocks because it's an easier way to see the passage of time. You can see 12 minutes or six minutes or two minutes on a timer, but it does, you can't really feel how much that is when you see that. So being able to see on a, an analog clock and mark off the time that you're gonna be working and see how the time is passing helps kids to see how much, just really get, get a sense of time. Um, I think back to when I was, you know, when I was a kid and I was at my friend's house and my mom would say, okay, five more minutes, you have five more minutes to play. And I swear we got a half an hour every single time because she was just talking with my friend's mom. So a lot of students have a really big issue with knowing what that passage of time feels like. So they can't always estimate how much time they might need for something. Um, some teachers at Landmark, I think more in the middle school have stickers that they put on their papers. If you've ever had Miss Mulligan as a teacher for one of your students, she often has a sticker at the top of her papers that asks the students to estimate how much time they think they'll need and then write down how much time it actually took to give them a sense of how much time is passing um, and get them to really understand you know, they might, they might say that it feels like it's going to take a half hour and then they realize it's only taking five. So that kind of gives them the ability to kind of sustain through um, certain, certain tasks that they're doing because they know like, oh, okay, it's only five minutes. I can last for five minutes. I can get that done. All right. Um, this just kind of ties in with um, what I was just speaking about with estimating how much time so you can understand what the passage of time is like. Um, it's also great to kind of have these visuals on our clock here to show how many minutes they are there. Um, I know several kids that have a really hard time with reading an analog clock. And that's one of the things that we work on a lot. Actually in our math department, we're learning about when we do our five times facts, we use the clock as a reference. So hopefully that's helping some kids to kind of get that sense of time on an analog clock. All right, and then for longer term um, goals or things that are coming up to be able to show the passage of time, just having a calendar. Um, I prefer to kind of move through it, adding the days one at a time so we can feel that time passing and not just have it fully laid out. Um, and I would typically have just upcoming events written on with some sort of marker. So this was a calendar from last year for my class. So we could see when we were having half days we could see whether it was blue or gold because we've got the B and the G. We could see if we were having library, which is the little book every Wednesday, or we could see when we were having social thinking. So it's another organizational strategy where it's taking away when the kids are asking when things are coming up. They learned if they wanted to know when we had library or um, when we had a social thinking class that the calendar would be a great spot to look. All right. Now I'm gonna jump into um, Brown's six clusters of executive function. Um, and hopefully we can kind of see how these tie into a lot of what we do at Landmark with our six teaching principles. All right, so Brown breaks it into these six different clusters here. Um, I've got kind of like an overview of each of them. And then I just also have a, um, follow-up slide for each of these, just kind of showing the ways that Landmark is really trying to help students with these six clusters. So we've got activation, which includes organizing, prioritizing, and activating for tasks. Uh, we've got focus for focusing, sustaining, and shifting attention to task. Um, we've got effort, regulating alertness, sustaining effort, and processing speed. Um, our fourth one is emotion, managing frustration and modulating emotions. That one can be a tough one. Um, memory, utilizing working memory and accessing recall. And then finally, we've got action where you kind of put, pull it all together and you have to be able to monitor and self-regulate your actions. So monitoring what you're doing and also monitoring what you're not doing. All right. So for the activation piece, um, some of the ways that we try to help with that organization and the prioritizing is um, having that agenda on the board, being able to see how we're organizing our class for the day. 
um, we track as we move throughout the class and throughout the day. So we're moving, um, either checking things off on our agenda or we're moving an arrow down, we're showing how we're moving throughout our day. Um, I'm better at this at school than I am at home, but filing items as they're finished. So <laughs> getting, you know, once we've finished with a sheet, not leaving it out on our desk. There's a lot of times that we'll be working on a project or working on the paper and I'll ask them to take out the next piece and desks will just be covered with, you know, like scissors or glue sticks or scrap paper. Um, and it's amazing how much that's not really recognized by the kids that like, that's not necessary to have out right now. They just know that they're, they're supposed to get that next piece, but they don't realize that like everything else that's out on the desk right now is, is finished, it's done. So we can put it away and get it, get it organized and put away. Um, I also, this is kind of a luxury being an elementary teacher and having the same kids all day is using the same systems for all the classes. And I know that most teachers at Landmark are using a lot of the same systems. Um, we try to keep that really consistent um, even through the middle school because uh, it's just, it gives the kids a more expected way to do things. So a lot of our systems that are implemented are across the board regardless of whether it's in a tutorial, social studies class, um, science class, math class. All right, we've got focus. Um, this has been an interesting one to kind of regulate being remote and trying to pull kids back in. Um, so this is why that organization of space is really important. Um, limiting distractions and items on and in the desk. It's amazing how fascinating a paperclip can be when you're in science class and the many different ways that they can be twisted and formed and you know sculpted. Um, when we're doing those desk cleanouts, that's like one of the main things that I find. I don't even know where they get these paper clips, but they're the most like elaborate little sculptures that we can pull out from the back of their desk. And for some kids, it's like an effective fidget tool. And so for some kids, it's really just, you can tell that they weren't really watching because they were making the Eiffel Tower. Um, for focus, I try to make sure that I'm going back and forth between um, items where we're in our seats and out of our seats. So tasks of short duration are really important. Um, if we can get a skill finished in six problems, I'm not gonna give it to them. I'm not gonna give them 10 to practice. We're always gonna spiral back. So we're always gonna go back to that skill and practice it again. So having those tasks of short duration really ensure that you're gonna have that student really focused and thinking and engaged. Um, and then our last is just giving clear task transitions and a heads up for when they will, for when transitions will occur. So using those timers are really great for this. Um, letting kids know that we're about to shift sets. They're gonna to have to stop one thing, move to the next. Um, I always like to give kind of a halfway point for when we're using timers. So, you know, we might set the timer and then I'll say, all right, we've been working for, we have, we had it set for five minutes. We've been working for two and a half minutes. We have half our time left. You should be about halfway done with the items on your sheet. Um, so that gives them a good checkpoint of like, oh gosh, I was spending too much time on number one. Maybe I should move on and helps them to kind of uh, get ready to keep moving their way through and know, know that um, the expected time was five minutes and they were kind of stuck on that one thing. All right, as far as effort, um, effort is all about regulating alertness, sustaining effort and processing speed. Um, so increasing effort comes when we are consistent with our breaks. Um, I, a lot of my students have trouble kind of staying still when they're in their seats. Um, so knowing when a break is coming is really effective to have on the agenda so that I can say, you know, like we've got a break coming up in two minutes. Or if a student says like, hey, can we get up and move? I can say, well, if we look at the agenda, we can see that's gonna come right after we finish this activity. So do you think you could just wait and we could take our break then? And they're usually pretty agreeable. And, and if not, then, you know, everybody's gotta move sometimes. So, but I just like that it kind of gets them to ask for the breaks and notice when they're coming. Um, a slow rate of speech when explaining can increase their effort. Um, I have found that my rate of speech has slowed down a lot. I'm typically a pretty fast talker if I'm you know, with my family or my sisters, but when you're in the classroom, 
if you're giving that more slow rate of speech when you're explaining things, especially something that's got multiple steps, um, those slower processors might not really latch on to what you're saying. Or you might have someone that, if you're speaking too quickly, hears the first thing and holds on to that. Or maybe they hear the last thing and they hold on to that, but they can't kind of process through all of it at the same time. So slowing down the rate of speech has been um, really important for me as a teacher. Um, having shorter, more explicit lists of directions. So I, as much as I can, I kind of pare down my directions and take out unnecessary words because those just lead to um, either distraction or misunderstanding. And then this is another one that I had to kind of really train myself to do, the wait time for questions. So um, a lot of times it'll feel really uncomfortable the amount of time that I'm waiting, but there often is a time when someone like eventually, you know, once they've kind of processed what's expected, they've heard the directions um, and they realize like, oh wait, I'm not quite sure what to do. Then, you know, a hand will come up and we can answer answer questions. Whoops. All right. Emotion. So for this emotional piece, it's managing frustration and modulating emotions. So um, one of the best things that I've done in class is just to really keep clear and consistent expectations for all, um, while also leaving a little bit of wiggle room um, in some places. Um, I think for some students as they kind of approach that frustration level, if they're working on something, it's okay to kind of lessen the workload. So, you know, if we're working on a certain sheet, I might say, well, great, why don't you just do like one through four and we'll get those done really well. And we'll focus a lot on our skills. We'll focus on our handwriting. Um, so give them something to focus on so they still feel successful, but maybe don't reach that point of frustration. Um, something that we use really, across the board as far as language that we use with students, if they're acting in a certain way in class is using the words expected and unexpected. So that's just kind of, it's not labeling it as a good or a bad action. Um, it's labeling it as something that we should be doing at that time, or maybe shouldn't be doing at that time. You know, something that's expected at school, but unexpected. Um, or excuse me, the other way around, unexpected at school, but maybe it's an expected at home sort of situation. Um, and then the last thing, something that I've learned is just uh, as we're managing frustrations in the classroom is not uh, naming how they're feeling, but naming what I see. Um, that's been really effective. So saying things like, it looks to me like you're frustrated, not saying like, oh, you're frustrated. Like naming how they feel can often increase what, um, the frustration that is that's being felt so you know I, I use that that language that looks to me like you're frustrated or even a lot of times students aren't really aware that their face is really giving away how they feel or their body language so saying something like you know your face is showing me that you might be a little overwhelmed so they're knowing that that's what the message that's being given and then maybe they're not overwhelmed maybe it's just kind of the way that their face is resting or you know that maybe they're thinking about something else but it's not really calling out what they're feeling, it's me saying like, oh, this is what it looks like to me. So they can recognize that, you know, the way that we express things can be different. All right, we've got our um, memory piece here. So it's util utilizing working memory and accessing recall. Now, um, there are four different things that we really work on to help out with, with our memory piece. Um, categories, are a big piece and that's across the board. We use that in oral expression. We are using it in language arts. We use it in math class even for, you know, understanding how to do story problems or word problems. Um, and they're not as inherent and not as easily kind of understood as you think. There's a lot of times that kids get really stuck on naming categories. And um, there's a great example that we use in our oral expression class at the beginning of the year that shows a picture of a very organized um, grocery store or a store with the all of the items kind of on the floor in a big pile. And like you think about like, which store would I rather go to? The one that's organized and you can find things or the disorganized one? So it gets kids to kind of think about why categories are important. We also work a lot on word retrieval. 
So if someone is getting stuck when they're trying to figure out a vocab word or something that they're trying to state in class, giving initial phoneme cues, or even you know the first syllable cues um, or letter cues can be really helpful and kind of trigger their memory and get them to be thinking of that word that that's kind of on the tip of their tongue. Um, oral rehearsal is something that we use in a lot of our classes as well, just kind of speaking through things and not having to take the time to put that written piece into it. So we do oral rehearsal of paragraphs, we do oral rehearsal of stories and oral expression. Um, we go outside and we hop through and get that multi-sensory piece in and use oral rehearsal for story problems for our math problems outside. And then another thing that we really work on is just vocabulary development. Um, that's a really big focus. So the beginning of each unit, we're kind of introducing those really like tier two, tier three words that they're gonna need that aren't necessarily something that are in like the forefront of kids' brains or you know they're very theme specific. So vocabulary development and then spiraling back and really using that vocabulary and getting them to use it in their worksheets and in their writing. All right, and then our last one is just the action, which as you can imagine is the hardest part because because it's taking all of these pieces and pulling them together. Um, so you have to monitor and self-regulate all of your actions. And then for some kids too, it's even thinking about just yourself and not others, like not focusing on what someone else is doing or not thinking about what someone else is gonna think about what you're doing. Um, in order to get this action piece to start, it's recognizing that you have the ability to do, do the task. And then also recognizing the ability to inhibit yourself from doing something else that's not the task. So the action piece isn't just getting things done. It's like also not doing this other thing on the side that you really wanna do, or that's really distracting, or that would be a lot more fun um, than what you're working on. All right, so I'm gonna end with this and then a quote from a student, but the best advice I could give is really just don't do for your child what they can do for themselves. Get them to try to use their skills at home because they're able to use them when they're at school with us. I think a lot of kids come home and kind of play the play the innocent piece and maybe um, don't really let you see what they're really capable of. Um, so even though it's easier, give them those chances to do what they can for themselves. Um, all right, my last piece here. This is just a really poignant um, thing that a student of mine said last year. So. Um, this first sentence comes from something that Rob Kahn, our former director also would say, beginning of the year, he'd always tell the kids like you wouldn't be at Landmark if you weren't smart. So we were in class and I said, you know, I just wanna make sure you all know that if you weren't really smart, you wouldn't be at this school. And my student responded with, do you know when I figured out that I was smart? It wasn't when I had to do all that testing because I couldn't really do it. It was because I got through all the years at my old school pretending that I knew what to do, pretending I could read and the teachers never figured out that I couldn't. Then I got to Landmark and I knew I had outsmarted them all. All right, so we've reached the end of my formal um, presentation here. So if there are any questions, I would love to um, dive in and answer. Hi everybody, it's Michelle Bernice. I um, work for the uh, Landmark School in the Advancement Office with Danielle Figuera, who opened us up this morning or the, earlier this evening. And I've been monitoring any questions in the chat, of which there are not any. So that just means that Meg has covered the full, you know, experience of executive function. But truly, um, folks, if there are questions that relate to not only um, your child and your family's experience um, within the classroom, but also, you know, if there's questions that bubble up about you know, life at home or how some of these things translate in a, you know, non-academic setting. I know Meg is more than happy to field those types of questions as the best that she's able. Um, so feel free to put them in the, in the, in the chat. So um, the question came in just saying, do you, how do you teach kids how to micro unit a big project? Any advice on that? Yeah, so um, we do have a pretty explicit way of doing that. Um, uh, a lot of the things that we use are really heavily templated that we use at school. So um, I know that in the science classes, I have done projects before where we do, we talk a lot about like the, the process of, um, you know, being a scientist or being an engineer and how they don't just dive in and start building right away. So there's a lot of planning that goes into things. Um, we have these great um, guides where we talk about like materials that we would need or, um, 
have planning phases and really think about the different parts of the project. So kind of get a picture of the whole project before we dive in and think about all of those tiny little parts there. Um, is that from a middle school parent or a elementary parent, do you know? She says um, they're parents of two kids, uh, eighth grade and sixth grade. Okay, yeah, so for that one, it's really kind of, um, I think a big piece of it is having that like big calendar planner. So if we are planning out to do a big project, um, the, well, we know when the end date is and we kind of like backtrack and keep a calendar of when different items are due and when different items need to be done. And also kind of give that midpoint as well. So we're not just giving midpoints with um, our time of time that we're doing an activity in class. We're also kind of giving check-in points um, to make sure that items are, have been started. Um, I know a lot of the projects that middle school and elementary kids have done are um, most of the work. There, I think there, there are some times when they're doing some of the, like the paragraph work or some of the follow-up work at home and writing, but a lot of times that work is done at school um, so that we can really monitor what they're working on and how they're working through and teaching those organizational skills as, as, they're, um, as they're planning and completing their activity. Great. Well, I have my own personal question. There isn't another one in the chat, but I, as I was listening to you and I was, you have a, a, a very long um, and successful tenure at Landmark and have um, taught a lot of kids over many years and situations. And I'm interested in your reflection on this particular topic of just students and their ability to organize and stand tasks and their, their ability to be successful with the, this realm of executive function in this learning environment, like with the pods and the on and off. I mean, you guys have built in incredible systems by which to support them, but I, I'd be interested to just get your interpretation of what you're seeing in your experience. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, to be honest, I was like, I was really kind of dreading having to do those like full at home weeks um, because I like to have a lot of control over what's happening in my classroom and that is just taken away when they're at home you know, in a different environment. Um, so I've tried to cross over some of the strategies that we use in class to when they're at home. So um, one of the things that I do is, you saw those like color-coded folders and all that. So um, I'm sending home color-coded packets that match the folder so they can, when they're filing their math packet, it's got a red cover, it goes into their red folder. Um, so even with the little guys, I'm seeing like the ability to kind of like find everything they need. There hasn't really been a time when we haven't been able to find what we need. Um, first couple of weeks, absolutely there were times that that happened. But again, it's that like wait period of learning how the systems work and really kind of making them their own by making them do them while they're at school, while they're at home um, to get more independent with those. Um, I've been really proud of just the way that my kids have navigated all kinds of things at home. Like we have them going into Google Classroom on their own and opening documents and submitting them. And um, that's something that's really amazing to me that they, they're able to navigate a lot on their own. Well, and I think in my opinion, um, granted, I don't have a student at Landmark at the elementary middle school, but that I think that these are almost subsequently good, just real life, real world, like lessons outside of that sort of bubble in the landmark world, right? Of like how they're learning their environment and learning to do for themselves. And um, and Meg, I'm gonna get in touch with you separately so you can organize my back and forth remote to home life. My filing system is a mess. So we can talk about that. <laughs> um, I think the color coding, I'm inspired by color coding now. Um, uh, there are not any other questions. So unless there are any th or any comments that Daniel wants to make or Meg, you want to make some closing comments. I know we're getting right up to time. So um, this has been a great presentation. Uh, Meg, I'll let you go first if you have anything to close with. Oh, I think you're you're on mute, Meg. I'm not sure how that happened. I didn't mute myself. <laughs> um, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming tonight. Um, I hope that I was able to answer some questions and give some guidance on things that just kind of understanding how your students are using some of these executive function skills at, at school. I know that they can't always all cross over to your home life. And I know that being a parent of a child and telling them what to do is different than being a teacher of a child and telling them what to do. Um, 
there are those times when maybe that emotion pulls in a little bit more um, or just kind of, you know, kind of hitting, hitting walls. Um, so I really appreciate you guys coming and just kind of hearing what an experience could be like for a kid when they're at school at Landmark and just know that we are so thankful that they're there. I'm, I'm so happy that we're able to do the model that we're doing um, and stay safe, but then also really get that in-person time with the kids. It's, it's really, really amazing the way that the school has kind of come together and made this happen. Thank you, Meg. Um, and thank you so much. This was an amazing presentation and so, so well laid out. And for folks that are new to Landmark, um, this is just a perfect example of what a typical classroom looks like and how our teachers are just amazing and teach to our um, students so well and continue to adapt. So I am, I'm not surprised at all, but continuously impressed. Um, so thank you, Meg. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. You'll receive a recording of this early next week. Um, if you have questions, please re reach out to Meg, myself, Michelle, um, any of the staff, happy to help you. And I hope you all have a wonderful, safe and happy Halloween. Take care. Bye everyone. <laughs>